Hey guys, happy April 7th, Sunday afternoon. It's beautiful here at the beach, and I hope it is wherever you are. Um, so, I've been talking a while about how I wanted to present information about servicemen's homes. I think they're communes. I think they are a negative experience overall, and they're cultic. It's very cultic, the way they go about recruiting single GIs to live in the home, and then the pressure, obscene pressure put on them to be there all the time and then to shuffle them off to the Bible school. I was trying to figure out what was the best way to present all this information to you about where the individual servicemen's homes are. Because then my daughter and I were talking about it and we said there are many churches that are not servicemen's homes, but they are near military installations. So we need to include them as well. This is the money maker for this group, the GI. And it's the same way with the House of Prayer Church. And if anybody wants, I can H-O-P-C-C. Put it in Google, look it up. They broke off from NTCC. They knew already, they learned from Roger Davis, the founder of New Testament Christian Church, how to pray upon the military, which is disgusting. And as someone who was reached in a serviceman's home in the Air Force in 1989, I understand the dynamic and I can't sit back and do nothing. It's, it's very, I can look back and you see your eyes are open to how it all works. My daughter's a combat medic in the Army. She's National Guard, but um, last year, I believe it was, she went. She was promoted to a full-time position as medical readiness in her area of the state. And so it's, it's very near and dear to our family, the military, and how they're treated and how they're preyed upon by everyone, car salesmen, anybody. Rental um, companies that rent out furniture and stuff, they're, they're, they prey upon. I believe personally that the line has to be drawn when people who say they are ambassadors for God or men of God and women of God um, do the same thing in his name. It's, they go through a lot already and to have this extra pressure. And I shared recently the story of a neighbor of mine who went into Marine basic training and when he came home before going off to North Carolina to school, I had a talk with him to stay away from this group. Like call me if you, you think you've encountered them because here's the thing. So I chose Lawton because I was made aware that Eric Love, who is a preacher's kid, his dad, he, he was, his dad is a preacher in the organization. And Eric was brought up in this church. Eric Eric covers a lot of bases because he's a young man. And yet he's on his second marriage. Which, by all accounts in the world, no biggie, right? Except, this is a big thing in New Testament Christian Church. A big thing. And so a lot of that has to do with the courting process and the oversight of that. And how some of these people don't get to know each other for very long at all. That's a big part of it. They're pushed together to make a match to go out to service the corporation. And there's so much out there about it. Now, when I saw the news report from Lawton, Oklahoma, about Eric and his wife as representatives of New Testament Christian Church in Lawton, Oklahoma, uh, getting together with seven other churches for Easter Sunday, like in a, in a form of unity, you know, somewhat, I was shocked because the NTCC does not believe other, other churches are doing, not only are they not teaching the right way, but they're, they've been raised up low these 50 plus years to, um, to do the work that these other churches aren't doing. Getting together with other groups is not what NTCC is about at all. We all know that any of us who are in it, were in it, 
will ever be in it knows that. It's made very clear and I've included a clip or two here from Keckel. So I wanted to spotlight Lawton because you have all these things going on. Eric is somewhat young. He's been married twice. He um, He's a preacher's kid. He uh, is a serviceman's home pastor and and director. He and his wife, I assume, live in the home. I haven't seen anything that says otherwise. That's a problem. We're going to talk about that, about this commune type setup. So once again, my encouragement to you is to, no matter what church you think you want to go to, type it in Google, plus criticisms, plus cult. C, has it ever been mentioned as being a cult? Does it have any cultic, authoritarian, extremist um, traits about it or history about it? I also want to address the fact that the man in Lawton who put all this together, he, um, last Sunday, I watched every single service of all eight churches that were in this unity thing. And I wanted to see, um, how does NTCC fit in with that? And, and are they similar? And, and should Josh Trueblood have vetted, did he do his due diligence when he met Eric and his wife, did he do the proper thing? Because I hold him accountable too. If anybody went to that church last Sunday in Lawton, because of this effort that Josh put together, he is going to be responsible for anyone that comes out on the other side with the same stories as so many of us. And how about the real the examples of people who still have no, have been shunned from their family. Every time you leave that group, they put out their lies and they put out that you have left God and the, that the Bible says to mark them and have nothing to do with them, to shun them. Or that if you dare to come online and expose and warn about them, then, oh man, you are a reprobate and everybody's supposed to stay away from you. You're just a hater. No, I'm a lover of people. I personally can't speak for anyone else who's ever been online. I think about this. I care about these soldiers and their families because I have my own intimate knowledge of situations and I know what on a day-by-day -day basis what these I'm going to specifically say soldiers because this is a lot in Oklahoma. There is basic training here on this base. It's a big base. This is a big situation here. A perfect opportunity to take advantage of them. I don't care how nice if you meet Eric and his wife. They are. They're a part of this group. See, all of the cloak is taken off now, okay? It's not like the days before we could go online and see and read things. And as soon as all of us started doing that, back when FactNet um, forum was on, we were like, whoa, this, these are the men that we're following and they're doing and saying these things online? Then you have to bear responsibility for that. Do you keep going? I still have hope for the people who have been in long time, but you know what? They've seen and they know now. I don't know. I don't know where they're, how they're, I don't know if they're just afraid to leave because they don't know what else to do. And like in that previous video I shared about, do you recognize NTCC in these clips? They were all different, various clips about um, cultic behaviors. And the one lady said, like, the worst day in freedom was better than the best day in a cult. Let's word it that way. And it's true. When you can do your own thinking for yourself and have free will, it's amazing. It's liberating. And I feel like the group of people that put this together had amazing intentions. 
I listen to all of their services. They all seem very down to earth. Um, there might have been a couple things here and there, but I'm talking about overall. They're all very different from NTCC. And I don't think they did their searching hard enough. You can't let... That's what draws people into the servicemen's homes. They cook meals that are better than the DFAC. And they're like, man, these people are nice. We have Bible study. We do this. We do that. But then the pressure starts getting heaped on. And the constant activity, constant. And the pressure to try to get away from your responsibilities in the military. That's not cool. That is not cool at all. So let's go through this. This is going to be the probably one of the longest ones because of this extra added stuff with the um, with the campaign called His Name is Jesus, which took place weeks prior to Easter and culminating uh, last Sunday. So let's um, start with a portion of the interview that I had with my daughter back uh, in October of 2023. Thank you. So happy Sunday, and we are here for our very first podcast. It's not funny. And I have, um, as I've as I've mentioned, I have my daughter Diana, who I'm going to interview first. And you're probably wondering why am I doing her first or at all? Uh, it's all the ways that she's a great interviewee. So I get jobs. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I know her. Uh, I know she used to keep meticulous journal notes all the time. She may still do that. She can tell you herself. She grew up in the church. I mean, she exited the womb, and boom, there she was in the group. Uh, she had no choice. She was a youngster when uh, we were in Bible school as a family. Uh, when we left for Pittsburgh to start a church there, she was with us when we came back, and I finished uh, my schooling she was with us. Um, she's also uh, has a unique perspective because she is just a few years older than Keckel's son, so she can give that perspective on what it was like to grow up among, you know, peers of his and hers. Um, she was there when we moved on campus in Graham and and was exposed to different things there, including uh, like a grooming or a pre-grooming by um, by some of the leaders wives um, she went with us when we went to Virginia to take over for the Dorsey's in 2005 and she was with us when she left when we left uh, the organization on January 1st 2006 which was um, she can tell you about that what that was like for her and losing all of her friends and so um, a little background, back in May, we were talking about church stuff, and she mentioned to me something that was said in basic training when she was there. And let me just insert here that she went to basic training in Lawton, Oklahoma, affectionately known as Fort Sill. And she had also mentioned a Facebook group called The Lost Kids of NTCC and that Keckel had preached about it or mentioned it in a service from that time. That got me going back to look to see, wow, they're, I, I, it was like a brave new world. They're live streaming and he's talking about this stuff. And so um, I'm gonna hand it over to Diana now. Why don't you, you wanna start with what happened when you were in basic training? Yeah, I mean, basically it was Ooh, about seven and a half years ago now. And what's your rank now? What are you? Uh, E5. Okay. But I'm National Guard, so things move kind of slow. Right. Um, when you go to basic, in the beginning, you have to do a lot of stupid in-processing stuff. You know, standing in line to get shot, standing in line to get shoes, standing in line to get this go to these briefs, which everyone has to have annually anyway, but they want to cram it all into like two days. So I hadn't really been there but a couple weeks, if that. You know, I was 26. 
I'm sitting there in these briefs like. Is that how old you were when you went in? I turned 26 like three weeks after oh, okay. I got there. I was 25 when I went. I forgot that. Yeah, I listed at 25, but. Okay. Went to basic at 26. But no, I'm sitting there. I'm exhausted. I'm feeling too old. I'm realizing my back wasn't ready for this. Kind of just going, what did I get myself into? You know? It's just one brief after another after another. You know, sexual assault stuff. Money handling. All the things that these kids needed to know. And I'm just like, can we get to something good? Because I'm dying here. Like, I'm falling asleep. And the way... You know, I kept getting yelled at by the drill sergeant because I kept dozing off sitting in the chair. You're supposed to stand up. I can see that. But I go to sleep without knowing it. So. <laughs> we had this one drill sergeant come up and he was like, okay, now we're going to talk about extremist groups. And I was like, okay, this is a little more interesting. And he started asking people different kinds of extremist groups that they could think of. Hey, you know, you got the usual, like, KKK, Nazis, you know, different things like that. I was like, oh my god, okay. And then he goes, well, what about a different kind of extremist group? He's like, let's think outside the box. He's like, what if I told y'all that a church can be extremist? Is there a reason why, what was the reason for the extremist group we, talk? You have to know that as a soldier, you cannot legally participate in things like riots oh, or I see, you I know, see. getting involved with things like that. Gotcha. Like they got to tell people you right. can't do this. And it doesn't them, represent make the them army. aware it's not always in your face. You don't have an opinion anymore. Yes. Your politics, your personal opinions, that's not what it is. It's the army, so right. stay away. Right. And so I was just sitting there like, oh. Well, yeah, yeah, that's true. He goes, I want to tell you all a story. And he's the first one that didn't read off the PowerPoints. Right. Which was killing me. <laughs> he's like, I want to tell you all a story. When I was stationed at Fort Lewis, Washington, I think he was some form of sergeant because he had soldiers below him. He's like, I, there was this church in the area <laughs> and I literally just like it was like caffeine hit me I was like no there's no way you sat at attention right <laughs> no I didn't sit at attention I just sat up I was like there's no way he's going there absolutely no way he's like and they had a bible school up there and it, it was not accredited so it was kind of just their own thing he said I had a lot of soldiers that all of a sudden we're going there and the next thing you knew they were being pulled away from base and actually living there he's like it caused a lot of problems did he give you a time frame for this at all like was this the no. 90s or you don't know okay. it couldn't have been that much longer it before. had to have been that or later right because of when they started there well i mean when, when someone's active duty and they were the rank he was when i was in basic right and the way he was talking he it could have only been like a rank or two below. You know, drill sergeants, uh, they're not there forever. Right, that's true. That's so they true. probably just pulled him from there and right, right. brought him to my class. I don't yes. know. And how they would take these soldiers and try to get them into their Bible school and were constantly having them there. He's like, you know, I don't care if you want to go to church. I don't care if you believe in God. But it was taking away so much from their work and away from, he noticed a lot of them were being taken away from their families. You know, yeah, you, you just do the normal thing. You see your soldiers like, hey man, how's your family? Well, I haven't really talked to them. Oh, you, you mean know. like extended family, yeah. not like a husband or wife or something. Because right. a lot of these were Because they? they were just single. Mostly. Okay, right. So he said he was very concerned and the fact that he started having a lot of these soldiers being broke. Money-wise. Right. Their, their money Not was... Not in half. <laughs> I mean... Da -da -da. Could have been mentally broke. I don't know. <laughs> That's a grandma joke. So, he went to a couple of the services, and he was like, 
their views. You know, you can pick out a few things that, yes, this is in the Bible, but it was on the extreme of church. And he's like, I, I want y'all to... What, what did he say next? Oh, he said, I want y'all to be aware of things like this. And he's like, now this church, they were called New Testament Christian Church. I about picked up my chair, folded it up, and threw it across the room at him just to <laughs> let him know I was there. <laughs> like, I said, I literally was like, yeah! To the point where... Did you want to, like, raise your hand? I know them! Yeah. I know them! <laughs> so, the way I was acting, like, I was getting real, like... Yeah. You know how I get real fidgety? Yeah. And my one drill sergeant came over, and he's like, Palfrey, sit down. What are you doing? And I, I just wanted to tell him. I looked at him like, <laughs> these, I don't know what he's talking about. Can I add to this, please? <laughs> like, God, this might be the only opportunity he gets to have someone add to this class. Right. But they wouldn't have let me. There was no way. I was an E1. Right. They didn't care. <laughs> so... Once he mentioned the church, I was like, I'm talking to him. He's not my drill sergeant, but I don't care. I'm talking to him. And that is pretty bold in basic training, even, you know, back in the day when I was in the Air Force, which is not anything like the Army, but, you know, basic training-wise, but to approach... A drill sergeant that isn't yours. Just to approach him, right. It isn't yours. The whole other platoon. Right. He, <laughs> so, he just... Literally laid it out there as a warning. Like, be wary of people that try to take you away from everything. Trying to take your money. Mm -hmm. Get you into doing something. And he's like, some of you may not think it, but churches can be that way. Yes. And so after all of our briefs were done, I, I don't couldn't tell you what happened after that. Because my brain was just... And when we left, I grabbed this chick who was 17... And I was like, you're coming with me. That's because we had to have battle buddy. You know? Oh, right, right. And she's like, where are we going? I was like, we're going to talk to that drill sergeant over there. She's like, you can't do that. He's not in our platoon. I was like, I don't care. <laughs> I will take whatever punishment I have to do. And you're going to do it with me. <laughs> and I ran up to him. And my mistake was there were people around him. Mm. And I was like crowded around him, like kind of excited like a fan and he started to turn away and i grabbed his arm you did not i you know you grabbed his arm you didn't tell me this was, part i was how old you're so used to doing certain things that it just happened oh, i'm and surprised he you didn't put around. you in the pokey no the moment he turned around he said drills i was like drills i'm so sorry i just realized what i did but i need to tell you the church you warned about i was like i grew up in that church and his whole demeanor just stopped. And he was like, are you serious? And he started to say something about, like, I'd love to talk to you more about it. And then my drill sergeant hollered from across the whole area. <laughs> I had to do push-ups. He saw what you did? Yeah, I had to do push-ups for like 15, 20 minutes. But did she have to do it with you, your battle buddy? I like, don't remember. Cause oh, like for my, not stopping you or something? All I could think about while I was doing them was totally worth it. Totally worth it. Right. Totally worth it. <laughs> but he was so dumbfounded. And as I was running to my drill sergeant, I was like, don't ever stop telling them. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's crazy. Yeah. That's how but that you know there. what I wonder? It's one thing to sit in a class and you knew of the group. I wonder how many people... Because of the stress in the environment, they forget the name. Oh, well, that's not a name. It's right, and it's not even so much a name. I wonder, I mean, hopefully later on, some people were like, wait a minute. Well, the problem is, is you familiar. get these kids, they go to basic, they go to AIT, let's say they're active duty, they get stationed like Korea or Hawaii or somewhere right. they're so far away from CONUS. Yes. And away from their family. And then their mom starts bugging them. Did you go to church? Yeah. You know, your true. father would want you to. Why are you making her sound like she's from New Jersey? I'm trying to make her sound like your mom. Oh, okay. There you go. Because <laughs> that's what she would say. It would have to be a Catholic church. Robert, though. get your dog. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I think of. Right. But, and we know just Those from, are also the kinds of families that really pressure. Yes. Yeah. 
Those until Italian you start going New Jersey people. I mean, it wasn't Catholic, so I mean that wasn't that wasn't that wasn't something they were happy about. Not just with NTCC, but before that, when I was in New Jersey. So oh yeah, like if you want, if they want you to go to church, they want you to go to the kind of church they want you to go yeah. to. I'm sure it's that way for most families. Um, it may be. You know, and we know the draw. I mean, I do from being having been breach and servicemen's work over in the Philippines. Is that? I mean, I didn't feel lonely and far away. I was glad to be far away, and I didn't feel lonely. I had a lot of friends, but there are people who do. So they go in for the home homemade meals and sit oh, around yeah. and being outside of the barracks, but. Especially guys. Yes, but by the time they start paying the monies and living in the home with the rules and, and their time being taken up and um, requirements. It was like that drill sergeant said. It wasn't so much that they were giving their time to God. Right. He was just so concerned about how much the church was consuming their time. Yes. It wasn't this soldier was like, hey, y'all, I'm going to take a day off. I'm going to take leave today and go read the Bible. Cool. Yeah. But taking leave or doing something else or wearing themselves down to where they couldn't perform. Now let's listen to um, portions of the video link I was sent concerning the His Name is Jesus campaign in Lawton, Oklahoma. And I've broken that up with some other clips. Eight Lawton churches are coming together in a campaign for Easter to welcome people to church. 7 News reporter Phoebe and Florian spoke to some of the pastors involved about why they decided to come together. Phoebe. Tara, they believe that uniting during one weekend out of the year to celebrate Jesus is something God put together. Pastor Eric Love with New Testament Christian says that the churches are competing 51 out of the 52 weeks of the year. Why would a pastor of a church look at what he does as competing with other churches? It's really odd to me. I don't know if it's odd to anyone else, but it's really, really odd to me. An Easter weekend is a time to put all that aside and celebrate Jesus as one, as a family. And I think maybe the church has become unattracted because of how much we disagree. You know yeah. what I mean? Especially in a political year, right? So to mm. start this year um, with unity in this city is is medicine we don't even know we need yet. <laughs> we're not all the same. And, and we are going to sing different songs on that Sunday morning. And we are going like, to do things differently. And so uniformity does not... That's not what we're after. We're after unity, which means we assume there's going to be differences, and yet there's something that's so powerful that we have in common yeah. that kind of that takes over all the other differences. I'm not really sure I can agree with this young man about that. And we used to talk in, within our churches, in our organization, about being the last hope for America. For this, we caught a lot of flack, which is anti-aircraft fire. I think they call it flack. We've caught a lot of flack and a lot of fire for even saying something like that. But it was not a, a thing that was far-fetched when you look around at what's going on in the world. And how hard it is to find someone still preaching about Jesus. And if they are, are they preaching Him holy, risen, and God? All of these basic, fundamental, and important doctrines of Christianity have been undermined by so many today. They say they don't want this to be the only year they have this event, and they want it to continue growing. You can learn more about the campaign with the eight churches involved at LawtonEaster.org. Does what these people are doing or attempting to do... Um, the good of looking towards unity override the differences like this, this kind of difference? The dad is to rule the family and everybody in it a reverence that causes us to not get out of line. To not get out of line. If your wife gets out of line and starts jacking you up and getting in your face, just tell her. 
You need to close your pie hole. I run this house, not you. You got the guts for that? You have to be nice. You can't be nice about this stuff. Nice doesn't work. This is obscene. I grew up in a home where I was verbally abused and beat all the time. Nice works. Love works. The purpose of preaching and of church should be to lift up Jesus Christ. Not a man, no special revelation that contradicts the Bible. And yet here is the leader of New Testament Christian Churches of America Incorporated contradicting what the Bible says and making it about works. Preachers of today, they're afraid to tell the people, hey, you got to pay tithe or go to hell. It's that simple. It's God said it. And if you don't, you're a God robber. You might as well put the gun to God's head and say, I'm going to kill you if you don't give me all your money. This group not only believes in tithing or go to hell, but they believe in back tithe. I had to pay back tithe when I was in the servicemen's home in the Philippines because I did not understand the concept that every single time you were paid, you had to give 10% off the gross and anything that was added unto you, like any increase, a raise, or money from a gift or a gift. This is not New Testament. This is disgusting. And this $8,000 back tithe? Come on now. Hey man, there's a brother here and, and uh, he's faithful in the work now, but halfway through COVID he sent me a text or he gave me a phone call. He said, I just paid about eight grand of back tithe. This is how Kinson opened up this service was to talk about that as if everybody was supposed to rejoice over it. Oh yeah, the corporation got the money. They were dancing in that office. You know they were dancing. He said, I'm watching online and God has kicked me good and I'm right with God again. Hey, that's the rejoicing moment, right? But no. To So what is he saying here? We already know Keckle said, tithe or you go to hell. So now for the years that this man was away from NTCC, he has to pay some sort of back tithe. And usually with that comes a percentage of interest that you had to add. That's what I had to do because of my ignorance. This guy was totally ignorant. I don't know if he was a former pastor and so he knew the deal. So he calculated it all on his own, how much it should be. This is one of the grossest things ever in this group, financially. This is one of the many reasons why you cannot be a part of this unhealthy corporation trying to lure you in with a few truths of the Bible and then they add in all their own like this mess. For these people, it's all about the money. It's all about leaning on church members to give more and more and more. And in all that, there was nothing for us, not just me, these other men, to give these big offerings and he and this other guys are the ones that take care of the finances so just offerings 20 or 50 dollars how come no one ever stuffs a hundred dollar bill in an offering make no mistake about it you are being judged all the time by your works, whether it's outward appearance, whether it's how much money you give, how um, do you come every single time the doors are open, you're being judged constantly, and they're judging whether you are right with God or not, and that's why most of the messages are around that theme. Many of us who left could not in good conscience before God, in treatment of other people, promote this 
tithe or go to hell and outward holiness, strict, strict guidelines, which interestingly enough has mellowed out over the years. And so then you have to ask, were they ever following God or was it a man-made thing? And the Christ-like love that comes out of this group is really quite something to behold. He's got this big old afro waving in the wind, you know, kind of like young people today. They know that the Bible condemns long hair on a man, so they just grow it up instead of down. The haystack on their head, that kind of thing. It's still long, honey. It's still long. First Corinthians 11. That's not my doctrine. That's God's doctrine. Get a haircut. I mean, I may have been green as a gourd, a stack of bananas at Costco on Monday morning. But I had enough sense to know that this guy was an idiot. And he kept me, what's he doing standing there looking like a dandelion about to go to seed? Like one of those guys of the 70s disco. Where's your bell bottoms, pal? I said, man, he looks, he looks like the world. Something else you should know if you go to one of their churches, New Testament Christian Church does not accept um, anything but the KJV as an authorized version of the Bible. They will totally mock any other version. And do count them but dung that I may win Christ. That's why I like the King James Version. He didn't, you know, I don't need some Bible version to take dung out and say, I consider it to be but poo poo. It's all about buildings, 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 mortgages, money, 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 money with this group. Uh, they don't even think to recommend that you could do anything else other than have your very own standalone building. They just don't even consider it. You, ha you start somewhere, but that's the goal. And that is not the goal. And it shouldn't be the goal. And it's why they soak you for money all the time, especially in the churches where they are holding a mortgage. And they are beholden to the name of the organization. They're the ones that sign for it all. If you're willing to throw down, we'll start a worship service. But we got to pay the rent on the building. Come on, don't just talk. Walk to walk, people. Where does it say in the New Testament you have to have a building? And again, they're the ones that use the Bible as a strict, strict guideline for what they should do. The King James Version. So where is it in the New Testament in the KJV? That you're supposed to get a, a building and force people and lean on them to be there all the time and to pay, 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 pay. Well, I just want the church to provide it, not just come and shuffling in once or twice every couple of months. No, 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 no. Are you committed? If you're committed to it, then throw down your money, pay your tithe, give in the offering, get a place, reach other people. You are not allowed in New Testament Christian Church to show up when you want. He's the boss, man. The pastors are bosses over your soul. You do it when they say. Whenever those doors are open, you need to be there. Because we've seen, I have so many clips out. Go on YouTube. Go listen. Go pick different services from their own YouTube channels anywhere. And find out the ones who lean on the church members and get on them for not being there all the time. They question dedication to God. That's works-based again. More works. You're not right. You're not here. What's wrong with you? Yeah, you have free will, but why wouldn't you want to be here? Oh, gee, maybe you have a family to take care of. Maybe you have work obligations. Good grief. Come on, wake up, please, please. It's very, very interesting that this man talks about just do this, just do that, just do this. He hasn't done any of it. That dude hasn't left Graham. He has not left Graham. He has not gone out anywhere to start a church from scratch or anything, anything like that that's pioneering, 
that is from the beginning. I have more respect for those that have done that than this guy who stands up there and has the audacity to get on the preachers or church members. Graham Washington has been stagnant for years under his leadership and Olson and Kinson. He's telling them, I don't know what you're doing. It works. If you do, go do what God wants you to do, they can't do what God leads them and wants them to do. Not like this guy, Josh Trueblood in Lawton, who could actually sit and be humble enough to admit he, he had ideas going on and he shared the process of the, of the think of the thought process he had, but you can't do anything like this in NTCC. And that's why Eric Love going along with all this unity stuff is so fascinating to me. Did Graham know? When did they know it? Did they okay it? Did he ask first? Did he just do it at the spur of the moment? Because, uh, and you'll hear the story in a few minutes about uh, um, Josh Trueblood talking about how he met Eric and his wife. So there's a lot of questions because no one does stuff like this in NTCC ever, ever. It's a no-no. It's like touching the unclean thing. So has a new precedent been set? Will Graham begin to do the same thing? Will they encourage other churches to do the same thing? It will be interesting to see. People that are putting that to work are getting results with it. And I don't know what you guys, you preachers are doing, but I'll tell you what, if you do it and you get committed to what God sent you to do, it'll happen. You were before and make the commitment. Oh, there's a lot of people, they go to church, they're in church, they do, they make all the noises and go through all the motions, but they're not really committed in their heart. They're not committed. And when the heat's on, you see what they do. And that tells the truth of what they really are. I was somewhere not long ago, and this guy doesn't come to church with us anymore. He comes traipsing in, or as Pastor Davis used to say, aping in. And sitting with all the brethren and, and eating and fellowship. And I thought, what does he have to do with us? What is he coming around here for? He's not of us. And Pastor Keckle's in town. Well, if he's not around when I'm not in town, I don't really want him around when I am. This is incredibly harsh, unloving, has zero details, does not tell any part of the story. But what you do get is that this man, if he ever had a pastor's heart, I don't know what happened to it. I don't know if he dropped it one day and has never noticed he doesn't have it anymore. I don't know if he ever had one. I don't think he should be personally in charge of people's souls in the way he has set himself up to be in charge of people's souls. You have someone coming to see you and you write it off, he's not of us because he doesn't go to your your uh, controlling cult church anymore. That's your indictment against him. You can't welcome him in love. Who knows what might have changed? No, because he doesn't have it in him. It's not an, a natural extension of who he is or what his heart is about. You can't come away with any other especially when you you put his clips all together go see the whole thing you have to just take my word for it but these are his words i'm not putting these words in his mouth they're his words he has to deal with that he has to live with this and he has never ever 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 come before everyone that he has absolutely lied about smeared trash talked over his bully pulpit, never apologized, not one time. Never, never. Everybody else is wrong. He said that in a recent service too. That he didn't know of anyone who left their group and was right with God. He has to say that. He has to say that. Hypocrites, two-faced, lying phonies, almost gag a maggot off a gut wagon. 
It's so sickening in the way they carry on and pretend and play the game. But they're not real. The Bible said if they were of us, they'd still be with us. I defy anyone listening to go dig into the KJV Bible and find where it says if you leave New Testament Christian Church that that's how you're supposed to behave. It doesn't say that. You have to read you have to know what it says and the context of what it's talking about. It's nothing to do with this. Nothing at all. He's using it as cults do to satisfy uh, their, their way of indoctrinating and keeping people in the seats with fear. If they were of us, they'd still be with us. You know why? Because there is no offense. There is no bitterness. Nothing that could ever tear them away from the fellowship of God's saints. And if somebody offended them and committed some sin against them, they would forgive it, get over it, and love them anyway. And yet the interesting thing, the ironic thing, is that anyone who leaves, most of us, wanted to stay in touch with our friends but guess what happened they shunned us and ignored us and had nothing to do with us right away it wasn't the way he's saying it's the other way around they're the ones who are offended my keckle is offended when someone dares to leave the organization the corporation as he calls it the business that his father-in-law started he can't stand it he can't get over it and so this is how he behaves it's not the people who leave that don't want to have anything to do with anyone it's the other way around there's a culture of shunning and of having nothing to do with them because they left their church because they moved on because they were tired of being manipulated and they were tired of being little babes who were coming in and being reprimanded in every single service. They were tired of going out to start churches and they couldn't have the freedom to follow God's will because it had to be gone through a board of directors. Come on now, speak the truth, Mike. Even if they had to put up with them and couldn't stand being around them, they wouldn't break fellowship over it and just blow out over it. They do that because they're not of you to start with, and that's why they disagree with everything. They're judgmental about everything and all these things like, well, take a hike, Mike. Fortunately and joyfully, I profess that many Mikes have taken hikes and left because it's not as he's saying. He is the one offended and breaks fellowship. Olson, Kinson, all of them. They get offended. They break fellowship. I know when we called to let people know we were out, friends, anyone that we had invited to, to church or the Bible school and we felt responsible for it and we called to apologize, I can't tell you how many times they just hung up on us. Friends for how many years? Some for 15 or more and that's I mean we did the same thing so what goes around comes around right but he has the audacity here to yell at those who have left and it's not that way it is not that way why does a pastor's wife need a PhD she's not committed she's got plan B in place what if my husband messes up? Here's a good one. Why does a pastor's wife have LLCs in her name? Pro for profit LLCs in her name. Hmm, Tanya Keckle. Look it up. Look it up. Google it. Why does she need that? She have a plan B? Hypocrite. I call a woman, especially in this organization where they've seen so many divorces and remarriages, I call that lady wise for thinking ahead to a future, even uh, if she stays with her husband, if something happens to him. She has thought ahead and wisely. Is she not the Proverbs 31 woman? If you're thinking about getting married and you're, one, you're worried about him messing up, what's messing up mean? It's like leaving your dirty underwear or sitting around or something? Messing up the room? Now he's just 
flat out insulting the women sitting there, insulting their intelligence. You really think that's what they're thinking about messing up? No, it's because they've seen how many times women have been cheated on by their preacher husbands. That's the kind of messing up. Or start drinking, carousing, not paying bills. That kind of messing up, Mike. Insulting. You're so insulting to people. This is not the group you want to be a part of. Well, I can reassure you today. He's going to mess up. If you're waiting for Mr. Perfect, you're going to wait for eternity. And only there will you find him. And it's too late then. The ministry won't take care of my retirement. Try making it successful for a change. The very own bylaws or lie, L-I-E laws of NTCC on their website state a list of things that the part of their purposes. Oh, orphanages, all kinds of good things they just threw in there to sound good. Retirement, like uh, uh, old age, home sort of i'm paraphrasing for ministers that's why that's why these men think that and ask that keckle because they don't have three jobs in the organization like you do like you admitted recently like you can find a clip of in the videos saying you have three different jobs and you get paid well for each of them they don't have that they're out there going to the plasma places, getting a bloodletting so they can pay their bills. You have nothing. You have all those buildings up there in Graham. Convert one. Convert it. Help your people who have been loyal to your corporation all these decades. Decades. Selfish. You're a selfish man. Out. That was rough. So because they had three people and they can't get anybody in the door, they quit and say it doesn't work. It doesn't mean it doesn't work. God set the church and the gospel as the means of support for those that are called to preach the gospel. He also said if you don't work, you don't eat. I'm glad tithing is not just an Old Testament teaching. Because if it was, the statements in 1 Corinthians 9 would not be there. For example, he said, did God write not, not to tread, uh, not to muzzle the ox for the ox's sake? He said, no, it was for our sake, which is New Testament days. It's for our sake that they that preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Man, the people ought to take care of their pastor. They ought to bring him veggies out of the garden. They ought to give him offerings, buy him Starbucks, take care of him. But nowadays, it's like, pizza's in it just for the money. But you should take care of him. You want him there when you need counseling. You want him there when you're in the hospital. You want him there when you need somebody to pray. And you want him to teach you the word and to study and get all that. But you don't want to do anything to take care of him, you loser. I will tell you that in listening to those seven other churches, and even with subtitles on the one that was not in English, none of them gave a hint of anything like this attitude. They didn't have fancy chairs up on their platforms where they sat and looked out over the congregation to see who was behaving what way so they could reprimand them when they stood up later no, they were just standing there casually. I think every single pastor was at like just a very, like a small, little, tiny, little portable lectern or table. But see, people like Kinson mock that. If they're not yelling and screaming at people, there's no way they're preaching the gospel. And he doesn't go in for all that Jesus' love stuff. This, there is no reason to go to this church. None. I don't care how good uh, the collard greens are, the baked beans or lasagna. You can get that anywhere. And I've said it before. You're better off eating out of a rusty old can of peas that you opened with a, 
a flathead screwdriver and a hammer than to go and and attach yourself and be a part of this group. And quite frankly, these other seven churches should have done their homework thoroughly because a quick Google of this church name yields many results spanning going at least back to 2002 or 2003. So I am very disappointed about that. But I chalk that up to their loving nature. Very likely they weren't looking for that in Eric and his wife. They weren't. They were quick to believe and quick to accept. But that is precisely how these people get rooked in. That's how it happens. I'm thankful for the day that I got saved and I was no longer in the market. I remember years ago, a young man coming to, to the church and he was, it was in Okinawa many years ago. And he said that, and, and at that time there were a lot of Marines in church and they would go down to the weight room like all the time all the time and i used to call it the temple of temple worship <laughs> as you listen to this keep in mind uh i also was there in okinawa when the ntcc church started by the ashmores it was very uh there were quite a number of gis there it's air force and marines and this is part of the stuff they do Now, Kinson obviously uh, comes across as having a problem with gyms and mirrors. And if there's women there, oh my. Like he's like all these guys haven't seen women. They've seen them. Let them go to the gym and see them there compared to other places in Okinawa where they can go and see women. You don't want them in those places catching venereal diseases and whatever else. And paying for the privilege to, to um, acquire them. But he's going to be all worked up about the fact that they work out in the gym. They're Marines. It's part of how they are supposed to keep themselves. And he is trying to put this evil spin on it. Anything can be evil. Anything can be awful. But he wanted to be the one to decide how often they should go there. And if it got in the way of them coming to church service, uh uh-uh, no way, man. This is gross, and this is a gross misrepresentation, and I don't think it's fair to the guys. And he's instilling, and he's telling something here to these people in this congregation, how many decades later, how many years later, something that is just not relevant and is controlling and indoctrinating. Why all the mirrors? Well, I'm not watching me. I'm watching her through two of them. Oh, the temple worship. The temple of temple worship. This body is a temple. Well, Phil, if you're pointing to your body and telling the crowd this body is a temple then how are you showing respect to it in your own life? I think you should step back and be a little more humble and a little less judgmental, especially in a cruel way, to people who are just going to the gym. Say, preacher, I don't know. I said, well, then why all the mirrors? If I understand. We're still there. We're still there. Unbelievable. And she's watching you. Well, maybe someone else. He doesn't even mention it as if he knows it because that's not what he wants to manipulate you about. 
He's going to give you a one dimensional reason for going to the gym and for there being mirrors. It has to be to look at some girl through a mirror. Maybe that's what he does. Does he go hang out places just to get a glimpse of someone in a mirror so he doesn't have to be gawking flat out? Oh, it's sick. Doesn't mean he should project that onto everyone else. It's not fair. It's not loving. It's not caring. And it's being dishonest. Now we're going to move on to Josh Trueblood, who is the pastor of Grace Fellowship in Lawton, Oklahoma. He's the one who put together this whole His Name is Jesus campaign. And let's hear from him how it came together. And I will probably have to clip out some parts because this is already pretty long. Thank you. And the billboard is not only going to declare His Name is Jesus, which, what a phrase, yes? Yes. To declare to people, but it's going to be on this billboard. But it's also going to send them to a website. And the website's supposed to help people get connected to church on Easter Sunday. And in the midst of the conversation about like, well, what should be on this webpage? Of course, the most natural thing is send them right to Grace Fellowship. But we've been talking about unity so much. And before I knew it, the words were coming out of our mouths. No, let's have several churches on that website. Amen. Not just ours. And as soon as the words were said, everybody around the table is shaking their heads. Yes, that's the right thing. That's the right move. So then we got the pastors together and we're like, well, who the heck can we put on that webpage? And we started thinking about it. We started talking about it. This is the practical stuff. We came up with five churches. Um, and, and here's why. We, if we were going to send visitors to these churches, we had to know that they were preaching the gospel of Jesus. Amen. We had to know that it wasn't a work salvation, right? Because Salvation is through grace. Grace like this? Preachers of today, they're afraid to tell the people, hey, you got to pay tithes or go to hell. It's that simple. It's God said it. And if you don't, you're a God robber. You might as well put the gun to God's head and say, I'm going to kill you if you don't give me all your money. It's not by anything that we do. We had to make sure that that gospel was there. We also started talking about pastors that we knew personally, because if we were going to send visitors to these other churches, um, we had to know that if they didn't wear the right tie or the right dress, they weren't going to get dirty looks when they showed up for Easter Sunday. We had to know that they were going to roll out the welcome mat of, of, of friendship and kindness to people as they came in the door. So we started thinking about churches that we knew the pastors personally, and we came up with five churches. And so then I had to email those churches and say, well, do you mind if I put your logo on our website? And they all said, yes. They all said, go ahead and put us out there. And then two of them wrote back to me individually and said, um, how do we make this even bigger? And how do we help to make this bigger? And I hadn't planned on that. Anyway, so then I had a coffee with one of the pastors. Um, this is Mike Keybone. He's over at First Baptist Church. And he's like, what if, what if we get t-shirts and we put a t-shirt on everybody in all of our churches and we have them all wear them out in the community so that we're all pushing this unity idea amongst people all at the same time. And what if we really blew this thing up? Amen. What if? And I started getting really stressed. <laughs> I like to be in control. I like to plan ahead. I like to know where all the pieces are going to be. Um, this was feeling out of my control. And I said this to Mike Keebone while he and I were sitting there talking, and he had just read some study, some survey that had been done in the Lawton area. And he's like, you know what that survey said? And this is not counting Fort Sill. It says there's 60,000 people, 60,000 that have no meaningful relationship to a local church in Lawton. Should we make this bigger? Should we do this crazy thing? And then I come in that weekend to church and Pastor Tanner decides to preach on boldness. And I was sitting right there, just cursing him, you know? And remember what he was telling us that day? It was, hey, don't pray that God would make things safe. Don't pray that God would make things easy. How about we pray that God would challenge us? How about we pray that God would give us the boldness, give us the wisdom, give us what the things that we need for when the moment comes? 
And man, God was working on my heart with all of this stuff all at once, all at the same time. And then he gave us this picture. I don't know if you remember this, but he's like, it's like you're walking down a hallway and you're about to go through a doorway. And you know that what's on the other side of that doorway, you're not capable to do that thing. You don't have the tools. You don't have the ability. You don't have the power. And and, and then he told us, he's like, actually, you're right. You don't. But you can pray, God, fill me and be enough with me on the other side of that door. So I went in that next weekend and told the staff, I'm like, we're going to have to put some crazy plans together. And they just rolled with it, which is amazing. And then we got all these pastors together that very next Thursday at White Buffalo. Here's a picture of that. That's all the pastors together. And we talked about all of this. I told them Mike Keybone's crazy ideas. And they were all instantly in. And before we got there, you're looking at that and you're like, that looks like a little bit more than five pastors. Here's why. So uh, there's, a, there's a gentleman here at church um, who knew um, a Hispanic-speaking um, uh, church um, and invited their pastors to come as well. We're like, absolutely, come on, be part of this. Um, and then I showed up to White Buffalo 20 minutes before our meeting because that's what you're supposed to do at White Buffalo if you want to steal the special conference room um, because you got to kick people out so you can have your meeting. And so I showed up 20 minutes ahead and I was all ready for this um, and there were two people in there and I walked in to kick them out. But here's the thing, I was wearing this shirt <laughs> that talks about God. And I don't wear shirts like this often with words on them, Um, but somebody at our church actually gifted me this shirt, and so I felt obligated to wear it a few times. Um, And then, you know, you start getting compliments from people, so you're like, all right, I guess I'll wear it. Um, God created so many moments and conversations because of this shirt. Um. So anyway, so I walk into that room, go to kick the two people out, and, and, and the lady, she just starts smiling at me, and she gets all sassy with me, and she's like, well, what are you going to do in here? And she, start, <laughs> she starts interrogating me, essentially, and, and eventually I admit to her that a bunch of pastors are about to meet about Easter, and she's like, well, we're pastors. I find it very interesting that Eric Love's wife referred to herself as a pastor. That is really interesting. I'd be curious to know if any of my fellow former pastor's wives ever thought that and were ever made to think that in the Bible school or in NTCC. So we already see a few things that Eric and his wife do differently in Lawton than following the NTCC model. She's like, you're going to kick two pastors out so you can have a meeting with pastors? And then she wants to know more. And, and they are brand new in this community. About a year ago, um, they became pastors here. And they're like, can we join in and be part of this? You're going to see them here in just a second. So five churches became eight, by the way by the end of that meeting, and they're all in. And I want you to meet them real quick. We've got a video um, that we put together with the eight churches. Here it is. <laughs> all right, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. <laughs> now it just shifted. We're Eric and Alexis Love, and we're from New Testament Christian Church. We are Michael and Courtney Lovett with The Life Community Church. We are Eric and Fabio of De Vasconcelos, and we are from Reaching Lives Church. Oi, nós somos Fabio e Erica da Igreja Alcançando Vidas. My name is Mike Keybone, and I'm the pastor at First Baptist Church downtown. I'm Robert Smith, lead pastor at Spring Community Church. I'm David Hubbard, executive pastor, Lawton First Assembly. We are Eli and Sheridan Garcia. And we are the lead pastors at the church, Lawton. Hey, I'm Josh Trueblood, lead pastor at Grace Fellowship Church, and we're all agreed on this. The most important thing is that you reconnect with Jesus this Easter. Isn't that fun? The the very first couple, um, Eric Eric and Alexis Love, they were the two sassy people who were in the room (laughs) when I walked in. I just want to end this by saying 
I went through and watched every service and recorded it from Easter. I did the one in New Testament Christian Church in Lawton and each of the other ones from that LawtonEaster.org website. And if you're in NTCC and you watch those, you, you're going to be aggravated because they're going to be everything that you think is wrong in the church world. But these people did not have messages of reprimand, of being like Heckel on last Sunday morning, calling people fake Christians pretty much right out of the gate. Um, there was just, it looked like fun. It looked like just you could come as you were. Uh, each service offered something, <laughs> interestingly enough, different. And so, um, but what is really different about them is they were willing to open up to each other. And I have to give Eric and his wife credit for that as well, because they, they're showing a heart that is anti-NTCC, that is willing to allow other people to be saved too. Now, you could say, well, they were just opportunistic to, you know, have people directed to their church. Well, yes, but, you know, like Keckel said in his services, was it matter if there's a petting zoo or whatever it is you get them in, you get them in. But see, I have a feeling when people come to these churches and come in, they really feel a sense of belonging and love and different things for everyone to be involved in. I did not hear the pressure at all to be there all the time, the condemnation, the condescension, the insults. I didn't hear any of that, and I was looking for it. And so this being the first servicemen's home that I spotlight, I am going to post on Facebook. And on uh, Facebook is Stay Away from NTCC. Uh, the blog is Stay Away from NTCC.blogspot.com. I will put each video and a map of like the the area. So I'll show the Lawton area. I'll show where they have church. It appears to be they're having church in a. It's called Irwin Chapel. It's very difficult to figure out. It looks like it's a shared space, so it's not their own. They have a home that's in Lawton, a serviceman's home. And as I said, very easy to say, hey, this is great. I can come here and get food and, and we have Bible studies and stuff. But they're going to put the pressure on if you're a single GI to come live in the home. So you may or may not get basic allowance for quarters or housing. Um, you may lose your space on the post or on base, depending on how crowded it is. And you're going to get in there and you're going to find that the schedule is relentless. Not only that, as I said earlier, and I want to leave you with this again, it's the vetting process. You don't know these people. So you come and you live in the home. What if you're the only one? What if you're one of two? Um, what are all the rules? What are the costs? What are the requirements? There's going to be rules as to where you have to be and what you have to do if you live in the home, what you can eat and when you can eat it. So you need to consider all those things. This is a commune is what it is. Why would you want to put yourself, especially if you're someone, you're, you're in the military, maybe you're on a career path, and, you know, it's very easy for someone to just say, he tried to rape me, he came, he looked at me weird, anything, and report you. Or vice versa. You could have a preacher or a preacher's wife make a move on you. It's not a good situation. And if there are children in servicemen's home, stay 
away. I'm telling you, stay away. Not just for your sake, for the kids' sake, too. They already... Mm, I'll talk about that when I, when I cover the next spotlight will be on Watertown, New York, and Woodbrook, Washington. Um, but in the meantime, thank you for listening to all this. Um, I know it's long, but it's important. To me, it's extremely important. And so at least you see clips and a glimpse of what NTCC is about. Doesn't matter how nice the person is that's greeting you at the church or that's a part of this unity thing. It's who are they ultimately representing? They're not representing Grace Fellowship or all these Reaching Lives Church or any of those. They're representing them their own organization. And Mike Keckle and Kinson, just some of the clips, that is the organization. That is the beliefs. Those are recent videos. Those are not old videos. So you can go and look and and see what everything is all about. Thank you so much for your time. Please reach out if you have any questions. Thank you.